Hallelujah is the only word that comes from heaven that doesn't have another translation in English, in Greek, in Swahili. It is still hallelujah. Lift your hand and just thank the Lord for the opportunity to be in his presence. Come on, magnify the Lord this morning. Bless his name. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 Hallel, Hallel Jah means it means to celebrate God, to magnify God. Hallel, Halal means to celebrate, to set aside, to make great. Jah. Sing it with all of your heart. Come on now. Hallelujah. 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 We bless. for everyone in this service that the entrance of your word will bless our lives give us revelation open our eyes open our ears help us to hear you help us to see you help us to see ourselves and to grow in your grace to the glory of your name we bless you you will do it in Jesus name come and put your hands together this celebration Sunday this super Sunday magnify the Lord for he is good. Hallelujah. Someone say, God is good. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Welcome to this service. Trust in the Lord that you will be blessed. We'd like to welcome all those who are coming to life class. We bless the Lord for you. We pray that you will be blessed. We always start life class with something to make you smile a little, little bit or to laugh a little bit. As a man and his family drove home, after church he was complaining about everything he said the music was too loud the sermon was too long the church announcement was unclear the building was too hot the people were unfriendly he went on and on complaining about virtually everything finally his observant son said dad you have to admit that wasn't a bad show for an offering of one dollar Oh, you got the joke. The dad gave only one dollar and is complaining about everything. This morning, we continue our teaching on our true identity in Christ. Or say true identity. Say it again, identity. Or say it like you mean it, identity. Our culture is very interesting. Every day before they give you employment, particularly in certain levels of job, management, middle management, senior management, executive positions. They give you sociometric tests. They want to know your identity. They want to know your personality. What kind of a person are you? And they use this to assess you. They do dream assessments. They do, in fact, when, you, when they give you, they want to place you somewhere. They tell you, answer these questions as honest as you can. And even where you are trying to bypass some questions they place some in a place that will eventually show who you are because they want to know your identity because your identity will determine if they can place you to work with other people but this morning i want you to know while they try all that they cannot know you after the spirit and your true identity in christ is what carries greater weight it is what changes your life physical appearance Wealth, power, success are not your full identity. 
a sudden job loss could leave you questioning even your own choices in life. When people have no job, they think, maybe I'm not good. Maybe I'm just not good enough. And uh, some story somebody carried about you can make you begin to measure your life. Am I a good person? Am I not? A teaching on your new identity in Christ shows that your identity is not taken from how people perceive you, but how God sees you. Somebody say, how God sees me. How God sees you determines many things because, and if you get a revelation of how God sees you, how I see you has a little impact. Cannot stop you from where you're going. How God sees you determines your success. Because you see, the thing with God and Jesus is that they look at a thing from the perspective of how they want you to be. Praise God. Gee, I mean, God comes through an angel to Gideon, a man who there had been a raid in by the Amalekites, carrying away their food, their family. And so Gideon hides in a wine press to grind corn. When God will appear to Gideon, a man who's so timid and afraid, he calls him and says, Hey, awesome warrior, mighty man of valor, God is with you. And he was wondering, how can you say God is with me when I'm hiding in a cornfield to, to, in, in a wine press to press corn, to grind corn for my family? You see, God was talking of his future, not about where he is. Many times people will give you a prophetic word and they'll tell you how rubbish you are, how bad you are. It's possible that they truly saw what you did, but God never leaves you the way you are. God always speaks based on where he's taking you. Somebody say, I'm going somewhere. Say loud, I'm going somewhere. And I will arrive in the purpose of God. Let's start this morning with the fact that you are unconditionally loved. I'd like you to say, I am unconditionally loved. Say it like you mean it. I am unconditionally loved. The Bible said, behold what manner of love the father had bestowed upon us glory to god he bestowed means he placed it on us you didn't qualify but he wore you with it i have osha that we should be called children of god therefore the world does not know us because they don't know him so don't take your identity from people's opinion but from the word of god somebody say from his word say it again from his word Look at that statement, behold, what manner of love the Father had bestowed or given to us. We didn't qualify, you know. People sometimes will say, if you do this, then I will show you love. No, when we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 5. When we were without strength, Romans 5, 2. When we were without strength, when we were yet sinners, God loved us. So you must always remember you must touch yourself every morning and say, I am loved. Even when there's no money in your account, tell yourself, I am loved. Even when things look tight, you need to tell yourself, I am loved. Somebody say, I am loved. Say it like you mean it, I am loved. So we have unconditional love from the Father. Please don't forget this, your identity. Because even in the church, sometimes somebody tries to beat our head and tell us we don't qualify for blessing, we're not good enough. And that's why you find people when you, they will say, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Yes, you were a sinner saved by grace, but you are now a believer living in God. And you must emphasize your new life in Christ. Somebody scream new life. Say it again, new life. That's who you are now. You are loved by God. You are loved not because of what you have, not because of what you can give, not because of what you have given, but because behold what manner of love the Father had done what bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Praise God. In other words, he bestowed it on us because we were adopted into his family. I told you the story. Reverend Steve, who preaches for us and who I go to his crusades in Ghana. He goes to play golf. He sees a boy who had come to help carry golf bag 
but Steve had more clubs in his bag than uh, normally you should have 13 clubs. But when you are still growing in golf, you go and buy all kinds of clubs until your bag is too full. The boy is starting to carry the bag. The bag is swinging him because it's too heavy. So Steve said, hey, stay there, stay here. Another one. Will... He says, sir, I need the money. My mother has about five or seven children. I don't know how many. He said, and if I don't bring money, we won't eat. And Reverend Steve said, okay, still sit down. I'll pay you. As he's playing the golf, God began to speak to him that he should take the boy as a son. He comes back and said, where are your parents? He said, I live with my mother. My, pa my father has passed. And he said, go and tell your mom, I would like to adopt you. I'd like to make you my son. Go and tell your mother. Ah, the boy runs home, tells his mother, by following morning, he had carried his baggies at the hotel. He's ready to go with Reverend Steve. Reverend Steve, we should, they, they said, no, no document. Just go on. You can do the documentation later. Praise God. Boy comes to his house. They give the boy his own room in the house. Just like other children have rooms, they gave him his room. He can't believe it. He gave him his own bed, everything. His shelf is there. Things are there in the room. Put him in a nice private school. Behold what manner of love. Did he qualify for it? No, he didn't qualify. But you see, the boy, it is a bestowal, but he does not yet know how to walk in it. So when they cook food and place on the table and expect the whole family to sit, he's sitting in the kitchen with the, with the cleaners to eat his food. They have to keep persuading him, your place is not in the kitchen. Your place is not with the staff. Your place is with the children. You have to tell yourself who you are in God. Because sometimes even people in church want to run you out of town. I like you to say, I know who I am. You know, it's very easy to sing that song. We are a chosen generation. Unless you really allow your spirit to absorb it. It took him forever to be able to accept that he who was brought from outside is one with the family. And they have prepared their children, let them know that this person is a child born outside, is equal to you. Totally adopted. As I speak to you today, he's an engineer married living in New York. From, from Cardi at the golf course to a son who is an engineer living in New York, playing drums in their church in New York. Come on, somebody praise the Lord. So I ask you this morning, where do you see yourself? Somebody say, I am loved. Say like you mean it, I am loved. Glory to God. That's why Paul said, when God is going to find me, it's not going to be because of the good things I've done. My Philippians chapter 3 from verse 7, I think, or 8. He said, all my righteousness was like a field the right. He said, that I may be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but the righteousness which is of God. So you must always remember your true identity. Let me tell you, those sociometric tests can fail you. Can fail you because they have a cultural perspective. When a, one guy came from the Philippines into New York to, to live and to get a job, they put all those sociometric tests. One of the questions says, you and the lady are going out, rain is falling, you have an umbrella. If you open the umbrella, who shall you cover? They both said, I'll cover myself. <laughs> to a Caucasian worldview, you cover the lady. In the Philippines, where it's coming from? Ah, everybody to himself. Oh. Now they will fail him based on a cultural perspective. Am I clear? Never let anyone put you down. Because they use the goggles of their culture to judge you. The word of God is your final test. Somebody say, I am loved. Say it again, I am loved. Praise the Lord. And may you walk in that love of God. Number two, I am abundantly blessed. Oh, this is a statement you must make to yourself when you go through tight situations. Point number 34 in our 
PowerPoint says, I am abundantly blessed. So I say abundantly blessed. Say it again, I am abundantly blessed. And the Bible makes clear, it says John 10, 10, the thief comes not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am abundantly blessed. I am blessed. Blessed in the morning. Blessed at noon. Blessed in the evening. Blessed even when there's no manifestation. I am a blessed person. I'm just awaiting manifestation. Say with me, I am blessed. Awaiting manifestation. Say it again, I am blessed. Awaiting manifestation. The blessing is something you carry. It is, a, it is something you carry in Christ. It isn't just a physical thing. It will manifest in the physical if you have blessing and you know how to believe and act the blessing. But before it is manifested, you are still a blessed person. So I say amen. amen. Let me give you an example. If, uh, I mean, when Prince William had his first child, the child didn't know he's a prince. He cried like other babies, behaved like other babies, wet the nappies like other babies, did number two like other babies, but he was still a prince, wasn't he? So positionally, the baby is a prince, but possessively and consciously, he does not yet know. Until there is a knowing, there may not be a carriage. When you now know and you don't carry yourself, that's when the world will say, don't you know you are so and so? Somebody say, I'm abundantly blessed. Blessed all the time. Praise the Lord. In fact, look at that John 10, 10. For a thief to come, you must have something to be stolen. If, some, if the thief came, it's because he knows you carry something. Nobody builds a wall around their house if there's nothing to protect. If your house is empty, only a glass of water and a broken bed. You won't waste money building a wall. You tell them, let them come and steal. They will even be relieving me of the bed that is already broken. So if God says, the thief cometh not, it means you have something. Oh, touch yourself, say, I have something. You see, because look at me, Rebo Shataya. Once God says, bless, that's it. You carry blessing. Later, there will be manifestation. So, Genesis 12, 1 and 2. God says to Abraham, get out of your kindred, out of your people, to a land that I will show you. I will bless you. You will be a blessing. I will make of you a great nation. Praise God. He said, I will make, I will bless you. You will be a blessing. It has not yet manifested. He said, I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. It has not yet happened. But has the blessing rested or not? It has rested. Awaiting manifestation. Awaiting manifestation. In fact, God gave him the package in one go. He said, number one, you will be blessed. Then you will reach a point one day in your life. You are not only blessed, you are blessing people. That's when he said, you will be a blessing. Now go to chapter 13, verse 2. The manifestation began. In chapter 12, the blessing bestowed. In chapter 13, the blessing began. In chapter 13, verse 2, it says, Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. So I pray for you today, there will be manifestation. Everything that will cause it to manifest will come into your life. Grace will come on your life. Blessing will rest upon you. You will enter what God has for you. You will not lack. You will not walk in lack. You will walk in abundance. The word of the Lord will come to pass in your life. Your eye will see it. Your hands will handle it. Your mouth will testify of the goodness of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Shout amen with fire in it. Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. So you are abundantly blessed. Whether you have physical manifestation or not, you have to speak what the word says. So how do you get it? 
If you don't have it now, but you are potentially a blessed, how do you manifest it? Second Corinthians 4, 18. Stop looking at the things you see. Start looking at the things you don't see. For the, thing, for the things you see are temporal. The things you don't see are what? Eternal. So in other words, take your focus. Begin to put your eyes on the things that you, you don't see. Begin to see your blessing. Begin to see your house. Begin to see your health. Begin to see your joy. Begin to see your spouse. See everything you need that will make your life colorful. Oh, come on, say, I see it. Somebody say, I see it. Say it again, I see it. Look at me. Just as you train your physical eye to see, you must train your spiritual eye to see. After all, God gave you something that is part of spiritual eye called imagination. If I tell you as you are seated here, imagine the Brighton Beach, all the white sand, and the cliffs of Dover. I want you to imagine it, the waves of the sea, the sound, the, 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 what's the name of those birds that are by the sea all the time? Picking. Seagulls. Hear the sound of the seagulls. Can you not hear it? Can you not see it? Can you not even feel the breeze blowing on your face and the roaring of the, for some of you, you've never been by a sea, matter of fact. All you've done is pay come to, to Kent. Go somewhere next time. You can feel what I'm describing. Praise God. Now that's just your imagination. Imagine your spiritual eye. See yourself blessed. See yourself healed. See yourself delivered. See yourself in the favor of God. In the blessing of God. You are now using a capacity God gave you to see. Glory to God. That was the walk of God with Abraham. In chapter 12, what did we say God do? God blessed him. Amen? But in chapter 13, what began to happen? Manifestation. But even chapter 13 verse 2 was manifestation 1. In chapter 13, after that level of blessing, look at me. There's a level of blessing you will have and people will misbehave around you. Lot began to misbehave. He thought, I've taken as much as I can from this, my uncle. Let me to go and blow big somewhere. Lot left. The same chapter 13, I think by verse 15, God took Abraham into the next level of blessing. God said, lift up your eyes and see. And Abraham began to look. God said, can you see all that land? In fact, not with his physical eye. He says, for all the land which you see, I'm sure he was using the eye of the spirit. In fact, God was showing, do you want to know how far God was showing him? God was showing him from, from Jerusalem to Iraq. Because that's what God told them later. When God told them when they were leaving slavery, he said, I have given you the land from the river Euphrates. River Euphrates is in, is in Baghdad right now as I speak to you. God was showing Abraham by the eye of the spirit as far as Iraq to the river Jordan. That's about 2,000 kilometers. He said, all of it is yours. Oh, somebody is blessed. From today, you'll not walk in lack. You'll walk in abundance. You will walk in all that God has provided for you. Shout, I received three times. Praise the Lord. The next one, of course, is that I am redeemed, covered, and cleansed. Redeemed, covered, and cleansed. We've been redeemed from the curse of the law. We've been covered by the blood of Jesus. We've been cleansed from all our unrighteousness. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, even as it is written. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham may rest upon us who believe. Glory to God. Oh, that it may rest upon the Gentiles in Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Somebody say, I'm redeemed. Say louder, I'm redeemed. What is the curse of the law? When you want to know the curse of the law, it's not an easy place to read. When you get home, you read Genesis, uh, Deuteronomy 28 from verse 14 to 67. It's one of the longest passages in the Old Testament. Don't put it on the screen today. It's all curses. Say, you go out, curse. You come in, curse. You marry somebody who sleep with your wife. You do this. That. Jesus, man, when you, when you are reading that part of the Bible, you wear a crash helmet. 
That's the curse. Sickness is a curse. Poverty is a curse at the end of it. So say at the end of it, poverty is a curse. Say it again, at the end of it, poverty is a curse. Now I know that some of it are self-caused, but the root of poverty is a curse because when Adam fell, God said, you will eat out of what? Your sweat and your labor. Before then, Adam just will reach out and pluck whatever he needs. You know, just pluck. If he tilled the garden, it was just to make it beautiful. Is somebody hearing me? But then when the curse came, labor became hard. Even childbirth became hard. God told the woman, he said, you will now give birth in pain. Curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Jesus came and hung on that tree in our place. Touch yourself and say, he took my place. Say it again, he took my place. End of verse 13 and beginning of verse 14 shows you one thing. He took your place, so the curse rested on him. And verse 14 now says that what? So the blessing rested on you. Curse rested on him, blessing on you. Curse on him, blessing on you. Now you shouldn't go around carrying curses anymore. You should go around carrying blessings. Oh, glory to God. You should go around carrying blessings. I like you to scream, I'm blessed. Say like you mean it, I'm blessed. So today I bless your hand. Everything your hand touches will be blessed. If your hand touches dust, it will turn to gold. Your hand will be blessed. Your eyes will see blessing. Your eyes will see blessing. Your mouth will receive what you declare. You will not live an empty life. In the name of Jesus. Now celebrate God this morning. So we are redeemed. And we are covered. And we are cleansed. Somebody say I'm cleansed. Say it again I'm cleansed. Which leads us to the next one which says I am washed. Forgiven. And saved. Because somebody will always tell you, you are not clean enough. Hey, Jesus' blood will never lose its power. No, never. No, never. Jesus' blood will never lose its power. It will never lose its power. What the blood of Jesus cannot cleanse can never be clean. The blood of Jesus is what cleansed you, not by the blood of bulls. Neither was it by the washing of water but by the blood of the Son of God. Give God praise for that. Praise God. That's why he had to be born of a virgin, so he didn't have the sin of Joseph. Joseph inherited the sin of Adam, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus was the only one born without the blood of Joseph or the sin of man. So I was coming, I just saw something that flashed on my screen. It says, oh, they found some lizard somewhere in northwest Australia that lays egg and catches without mating. I said, yeah, it's, they didn't start today. God did it by making Mary the other time. Praise God. I said, praise the Lord. So this morning, you need to know this, that you are washed, you are forgiven, and you are saved. When God took your sin, he threw it to the sea of forgetfulness. The Bible says he forgave our sin. He, in fact, the Hebrew word suggests, look at me, it suggests something like grabbing your sin and throwing it back, and it is three rolling in eternity. Rolling back and rolling back. No longer to come back to you. You and your past will never connect. It's already forgiven. And you go to Greenwich, and you go to Greenwich Maritime Place where they say the east, is it the east and the west? Yeah. Where the east and the west are separated, they tell you they can never meet. Sometimes I always wonder how come it always is the Englishman that discovers where the east and west is. How come? Why was it not in my village? Why did it have to be in Greenwich? Anyway, that's for another day. But one thing is very clear east and west can never meet. You and your sins can never meet. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. 
Praise God. That's why the man could sing, It is well, it is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. Your soul is now well because you are forgiven. You are washed, you are saved. Somebody say, I'm saved. Listen to me. Listen. Don't let anybody write. You should live right. Tell your neighbor, live right. If I shout on them, I say, live right. Because mm -hmm. salvation is one thing. But you got to live right. However, once Jesus saves you, don't let anybody put anything on social media, YouTube. I say, I saw one woman in hell because she wore trousers. That's total, forgive my friend, total crap. Trousers don't determine if people go to heaven or not. Were you saved? Were you washed? And were you forgiven? How much did God forgive you? Half? 50%? In Christ Jesus, how good are you? 5% or 100? I told you the story before. Flying out of Africa one time in first class cabin with these Indian industrialists. He was sitting by my side. And when I told him I was a pastor, he said, I am a, my guru told me because he sold his industries and given the money to charity. He said, my guru told me I'm now 5% good. So I told him, my own guru told me I am 100% good. And he's wondering how my guru did it. I said, he did it on the cross of Calvary. Pray, somebody praise the Lord. You are totally washed, totally forgiven, and totally what? Our salvation is tripartite. He saved us from the penalty of sin. He's saving us from the power of sin. And when he shall come, he shall save us from the presence of sin. Because you are still in the world of sin. You find yourself making mistakes, getting into errors. Because you still live in the presence of. Even if you didn't want to do anything, somebody will make you do it. Somebody stepped on your leg and said, did I do anything? Was it not too little stepping? And something inside you rises and you feel like punching and you say, praise the Lord. Because <laughs> you're still living here. But he shall save you from the presence of sin. Oh, glory to God. Aren't you glad for what Jesus did for us? Some say, I am washed. I'm forgiven. I'm saved. Saved with some power in it. I am washed. I'm forgiven. I am saved, I am washed, I'm forgiven, I am saved. Praise the Lord. You now make it a song in your bathroom when you go to wash, just tell us. I am washed, I'm forgiven, I am saved. Praise the Lord. Oh glory to God. I have a kata. That's why Christianity is not a religion. Because religion... It, 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 it just tempers you, tempers you, tempers you to take all the nonsense in the world, tempers you, tempers you. That's what Karl Marx said. Religion is the opium of the people. When people take opium, they, they are relieved from pain. Religion is to relieve you from pain so that you just, you just endure. That's why a musician in my country said people in religion uh, suffer, suffer for world, enjoy for heaven. No, 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 no. Christianity is not for suffer, suffer for world. Enjoy for heaven. Muslim go, they say, Allahu Akbar. No, no. <laughs> I don't even know how I know those songs. I promise, I don't, I don't buy the record. Pastor MC is my witness. <laughs> but it's just I have a funny brain. If I walk past where they play it, it will just talk. <laughs> Anyway, it was my favorite artist before I got born again. Favorite artist. So Christianity tells you you are a child of God. The day you receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, you were born what? Again. So the day I was born into this world, I was an Ashimolo, no doubt. If you see my papa, <laughs> you will know that. <laughs> That's another song, isn't it? You know that I'm like my father. Praise God. But not just, you see me, I'm my brother, I'm my sister. 
that is, the semblance is amazing. We come from the same root. Same thing when you get born again. Something happens. That day, your life changed. That's why Jesus said there is joy in heaven over one sinner who does what? Who repents. Ah! Celebration. Angels on Hallelujah Boulevard are dancing every time souls get saved. Glory to God. So when we went to hold our crusade in November and 10,000 people gave their life, there must have been 10,000 hallelujahs. Glory to God. In fact, the biggest day of salvation was the first day when the rain poured and the people stayed and almost 2,000 gave their life. Give God praise. Somebody say, I'm washed. I'm forgiven. I am saved.